Welcome into K State Online. I'm Mason Voth, joined by Drew Galloway as it's time to break down one of the latest commits to the Kansas State Wildcats. That would be a product out of the Topeka area. The Cats got him to flip from Nebraska. It is defensive back Callan Barta, who ends up making the move, now will be a Wildcat this upcoming year. Big for the Cats because I know some people were overly concerned about only having seven commits at the time when uh, Barta made the move, but bumped him up to eight. They eventually got to nine, and you know, smaller class was always the plan, but they are still trying to add guys and find guys that are of quality to do it. And Callum Barta is a guy in the backyard that seemed to fit the bill, and they were able to jump in and, and get him to leave Nebraska for K-State. So, Drew, I guess give us the, the breakdown in a bunch of different areas on this, kind of what it means, how the process played out, and, and where things go uh, from here. Uh, so what it means for K-State is that it's another in-state win. This is uh, in-state uh, prospect number four of the 2024 class to commit to K-State. Every year under Chris Kleiman, they've had at least four guys in-state uh, commit to K-State, which has kind of helped turn the tide around a little bit in-state. Because, I mean, this, this is a battle that K-State probably three, four years ago probably doesn't win. And it shows the trajectory of the program that they can come in and in about a month, because even though Callan Barta tweeted out the offer the Monday before uh, the official visit over the weekend, he had that offer for about a month. And uh, I went to his game uh, last Friday night and just kind of talked to him about his whole process, like what kind of went into everything. And he said, like, he legitimately said that it probably was a 15 minute ordeal. Like when he had, when he was thinking about posting the offer or not, because he knew that it would kind of open up a can of worms and everybody would be really interested to see kind of how it plays out. But then he ended up posting it and then he goes on the visit and he was there uh, Saturday morning and he was probably home for about, two hours maybe less uh and actually called the nebraska staff on the way home telling him that he was decommitting from nebraska and then flipping to k-state yeah i mean that uh that the whole process when he jumped up on the radar it, it moved fast once he made his decision to go public with it so i mean we can talk more later about the whole process and and, and projection wise but i mean right now what did you see out of him when he uh, was on the field last friday when you were there in person to watch the vikings play uh so last friday it, number one it was kind of a sloppy game to be at uh i remember texting uh you and derek uh saying like there's been a lot of turnovers in this game. Like there just hasn't really been a, there wasn't a big flow and something that I didn't really think about uh, before the game was that this is the third time that I've actually seen Callan Barta. And it was probably the best that he had looked. He's super fluid. He actually plays corner and receiver for Seaman. So it's kind of interesting that he plays on both sides of the ball. Um, and he had a 75 or 74 yard touchdown uh, reception where he has really, really good speed and runs probably like low four fours. I'd say four, four, five, four, five in that range. And he just cooked the opposing defensive back and took it to the house. And then on defense, he was very physical. He moves well. He has good hips. Um, it's kind of interesting. And I pointed it out in recruit of the week last week that uh, it's interesting that they're recruiting a high school corner and flipping him to safety where we've seen that with Josh Hayes. You've seen it with Marquis Siegel now out of the transfer portal, but now they're trying to do that at the high school level. And I, I would say that uh, my comparison for, or my player comp for Barta would probably be a little bit more Josh Hayes than Marquis Siegel just because I think that Barta is better in coverage than Siegel has been so far. But I think that they're very similar. And while at one point it looked like it was going to be strong safety, he's kind of open to playing all three spots and they're just going to try and figure out where he uh, ends up being. And like we, we've seen VJ Payne move around a little bit. Kobe, Kobe Savage has moved around a little bit. So I think playing all three spots could be beneficial and, it, I think he is a little bit more of a free safety than strong safety after seeing him just because of his coverage ability. 
Well, so, you know, you, you talk about him going to be a safety. I know that some people had, had talked about and speculated, well, is there the speed and other assets to be played elsewhere? But you're you're pretty confident that it's going to be safety for him at K-State? Yeah, I, I think that his speed and physicality it, it is probably better at playing defense and playing safety than playing receiver. Okay, well, that that's, I mean, look, I think uh, the people see a, a guy that has a little bit more size and some speed attached to him, and they think, well, K-State hasn't had a receiver like that in a while. They'd like to see it, but obviously this staff has proven they know where to put guys on the field. And I think early on it became clear that they were just going to go out, they were going to get the athlete, and then figure out what position he fit. Now, kind of like what you're saying, they're finding somebody that maybe has some of the more – define skills for one side of the ball or one specific area, but they're going to get that refined even more and put them in a position where they think they can really succeed and help the team. And obviously for Barta, that's at safety. So uh, that's that's probably good to note. Uh, before we, we get on to, to kind of what you would project for him once he gets to K-State and everything, I mean, w- what should people know about this recruiting process as a whole? You talked about the how it moved from him, you know, posting the offer he got from K State, calling the Nebraska coaches, and then becoming a Wildcat. I mean, what? Why is it that there there appear to be you know so few few offers there at some point, or was it just something that it got wrapped up so early with Nebraska that nobody else was really budging, or he just wasn't posting offers until one really caught his eye and made that decision? Honestly, I think that it just happened so fast with Nebraska that it kind of caught everybody else off guard. I know that um, it caught me off guard because he was at a K-State camp actually before he went to Nebraska. And Nebraska didn't offer him at the camp, but they uh, told him to come on an official visit. And he went official visit, got the offer, and committed all within like five or six days. And I think that that just happened so fast that there wasn't a lot of room for other schools to get involved. Which is really interesting because uh, you see that kind of play out uh, with some K-State commits. Like Gus Hawkins is the same way where uh, K-State got such a big lead and he went ahead and committed uh, before last football season even was over. That once once kids uh, commit somewhere and shut it down, you don't really see other places pop in. But an interesting note, and I I tweeted it um, after Bart ended up committing is that uh, he actually has helped run, or Barta has actually helped run concessions on in the east side club level and has since eighth grade. And he was actually at the UCF game working concessions for K-State. And I, I think that that's kind of when K-State realized that they had an in because he's in Manhattan a lot. And then a, a big hand uh, for this recruitment, and it wasn't just Joe Klanderman, but it was uh, Taylor Bratt who is all over this like he is with almost every in-state kid that there ever will be, that they knew that they had an in, and as soon as they got him on the visit, I mean, I like I said, like he was home for probably two hours maximum before he ended up making the call to K-State. Um, another interesting note about kind of the process is Wesley Fair was his host of the official visit, which another Kansas kid, another safety, so they kind of knocked that out and it was good that uh, both sides were in a lot of contact leading up to the visit with a uh, fair and Barta exchanging messages. And now Avery, jo- he said that Avery Johnson has helped uh, kind of get a recruiting pitch to him. So K-State really knocked this out of the park. I mean, this is recruiting 101. You find a kid, you want him, you get him to visit as soon as possible. You close the deal. I mean, that that's, excellent process by k-state and i think seeing some of his senior tape also helped them kind of jump on to hey we need this kid and we need him probably sooner rather than later so to close things out then i mean this is always a a tough thing to do but i mean what what's the projection what should people have in mind for his career at k-state and maybe how things play out i mean you said earlier you see more as like a josh hayes type than a marquis siegel so what, what does that ultimately mean in your eyes? Uh, so what K-State's getting and where he could potentially go, it, it's just so hard to know right now because he's not a finished product. But I, I will say that enrolling early 
is a massive benefit. I mean, we we've saw, we saw that with Austin Romaine, who was one of the lower rated kids in the class. Callan Barter right now is one of the lower rated kids in the class, but you get him to enroll early and anything can happen. I mean, I, I really like his frame. I like how he moves. I think that uh, free safety, maybe strong safety even, could be his potential home. Uh, I think that his best trait, which is something that I was kind of hesitant on uh, leading up to going to his game on Friday, is kind of the physicality. Because I, I just wasn't sure because he doesn't have a ton of uh, highlights on the defensive side of the ball on his uh, midseason highlight tape. So it's kind of hard to judge. So like when you get to him and watch him in person, the the one, number one thing that I was looking forward to uh, seeing is like how willing is he to come up and hit? How willing of a tackler is he? And he hits well. And I mean, he knocked one kid out from Piper pretty good uh, at the game Friday night. And had two interceptions. So, I mean, he, he was all over the place. Um, I, I just, it's hard to say, like, is he going to be a future all-conference player? Is he going to be drafted like Josh Hayes was? I, I, I don't know right now. But I know that with a lot of guys in the secondary, and especially with, with this staff, it, they don't really miss on their evaluations very much because they're so careful. I mean, we, we saw Jack Fabris, another kid that was one of the lower rated kids in the class uh, last year. And he's played in four games. He played in four games. And even I think that, oh, he didn't start uh, the um, CMO game, but he was in right away on like the first drive. So we've seen them knock out uh, secondary evaluations before. And I, I think that that will probably hold true here. All right, well, that's the lowdown on Callan Barta, the eighth commit of the class of 2024 for the Wildcats as they continue to try and scour and look for more flips out there to get. And uh, stay locked in with K-State Online so Drew can keep bringing you all the great recruiting info throughout the rest of the season and as we kind of build up towards signing day, which will be here before we all know it. So that's uh, what you need to know on Callan Barta. That will do it for Drew Galloway and I, Mason Voth. Thank you for watching K-State Online.